Hey everybody, so let's talk migration and its causes. What is migration? Um, well, if you recall from last time we talked about this stuff, migration is different from circulation in that circulation is your sort of everyday, daily, temporary movements, um, but migration refers to permanent long-term relocation from one place to another. Uh, this is a slide showing off um, some historical human migrations in modern times. Now, when we say modern in the wide world of history and the social sciences, we tend to use modern to describe the age of exploration. So this map refers to human migrations in modern times. So this first one here is um, European emigration from Europe to the Americas. Then we have um, European migration from places like Portugal and Spain to the Caribbean, right, during the age of exploration. Um, travels to places like Australia. And after that, we have some migrations by other peoples that are directly tied to European intervention, the most famous of which is the transatlantic slave trade. And this is the sort of pattern that was taken there. Um, and folks from Africa were taken to anywhere from places in South America to the Caribbean and the United States. Now, there are different kinds of migration. So there's voluntary migration where people have a choice to move or stay. So this is your basic, eh, I live in this city, but Maybe I want to try out my luck somewhere else. Maybe I need a change of pace. Uh, maybe you're moving someplace in order to go to college and you end up remaining there. Um, that would be voluntary migration. You have a choice to move or stay, but you end up moving for any number of reasons. Not so voluntary migration is reluctant migration. It's less than fully voluntary, but it's not totally forced. So what do we mean by that? Any economic migrant is a reluctant migrant. All things being equal, if everything was exactly as they would like it, they would probably end up staying in their home country. But there are other forces beyond their control that make it so that it would be way easier on them if they left than if they stayed. Um, other places are looking for opportunity or land of their own. Um, such as the 75 million people that moved from Europe to the Americas between 1835 and 1935. So over that 100 year span, think about what happened there, right? We have our beautiful Statue of Liberty hanging out near Ellis Island asking for your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning or longing to be free. And people took that as an open invitation and a lot of people came in droves. Sometimes you might want to stay in a place, but there's just no room. So in Indonesia, um, Java, which is right down here, the island of Java was actually relatively uh, pretty overcrowded. And so people had to move away um, as the population grew. There was no place to put them. So they had to migrate elsewhere. So people resettled from an overcrowded Java somewhere else. If there was enough room, then these people might have stayed. If there were enough opportunities for Europeans um, in the uh, mid to late 1800s, early 1900s, then they might have stayed. Um, and if economic conditions were great in whatever home country economic migrants come from, then they probably would have stayed. But they end up leaving. And that's reluctant. I'd, maybe I'd rather stay if things were awesome, but I gotta go. So places that take part in such reluctant migrations include migration from Latin America to the US. Um, this map is an example of a sort of graduated symbol map where the size of the arrows changes depending on the magnitude of what is being measured. So here we see that the majority of migrants from Latin America come from Mexico and in a far, far away second are places like El Salvador and Cuba. Um, this is as of about 2005 or so, and some numbers change and conditions change, 
but that's about where it is that a lot of people come from. So Mexico, El Salvador, Cuba, Haiti, places like that. Asia um, is seeing the same sort of migration pattern. Uh, this is migration as of 2001, and there are folks coming to the United States from Asia, mostly from India, China, the Philippines, and Vietnam. And usually these are reluctant migrants that are exhibiting any number of either economic hardships or possible overcrowding or potentially just seeking better opportunities elsewhere. Then there is on the spectrum of migration, um, on, all the way on the other end, is forced migration. And forced migration is imposed relocation by one group over another group, which causes refugees. For example, the transatlantic slave trade is one example of forced migration. Africans taken against their will and shipped off to various parts of British North America, um, Spanish Americas, uh, the British owned Caribbean, the Danish owned Caribbean, the French Caribbean, the Dutch owned Caribbean, and Brazil. And this here is a sort of kind of graduated symbol there, in the sense that the bigger the arrow, the greater the magnitude of people. And we are talking millions, millions and millions of people um, forcefully migrated from Africa, forcefully migrated from Africa between 1701 and 1810. Australian convicts. Um, you may have heard that Australia um, owes its history a lot as being a sort of site where um, kind of British convicts, prisoners, felons, etc., uh, were sort of shipped off to Australia. And depending on uh, the kind of Australian you ask, um, there are some that might have might see it as a point of personal pride um, as being a country built by. Britain's rejects, right? We weren't wanted, and yet we made ourselves a pretty decent home and a pretty decent country anyway. Um, but those people did not go to Australia by choice. No siree. Siberian labor camps are another example, as well as the Trail of Tears, um, where uh, Europeans invaded, took much of the land of Native Americans, and forced them away from their homelands. The Holocaust is another example of forced migration, right? Uh, millions and millions of people moved into concentration camps. Rwanda in 1994, as well as Darfur Sudan in the present, um, are also exhibiting these kinds of forced migrations. Now, usually when we think of migration, sometimes we think of migration as having it be um, from one country to another country, but if any of you moved from one part of the U.S. to all the way over here to Miami, then congratulations, you are an internal migrant. You are a domestic migrant um, because you have relocated within a country's borders. So here is a map of the U.S. Um, as of uh, 2007. And this is a map showing off the net regional U.S. migration as of 2007. And it's pretty much showing where it is that people are coming from and where they are mostly going. So for the most part, people are heading in the hundreds of thousands to the south, and people are also more likely to move to the west, with very, very few people choosing the Midwest to be their home. And I wonder why that is. Try and think about why it is that a lot of people are moving south and why it is that a lot of people are moving off to the west. The answers may surprise you. Other places that are exhibiting um, internal migration include Colombia, where it's seeing a shift between people living in rural spaces um, and those folks are moving to more urban environments. Same thing in Russia, as well as China, where we see significant movement towards industrial cities in search of um, economic opportunities. And in the U.S., there's a long history of internal migration uh, from the 1800s policy of a kind of westward ho, westward expansion, manifest destiny, and all that jazz. Um, 1910 to 1930s, what's known as the Great Migration, is another sort of spread west. And then today, a lot of people are moving towards the west and towards the south. So if you had a chance to sort of think about why it is that people are moving to the west coast, 
uh, might be a little thing called the tech boom. And people trying to um, kind of try their hand at making the next killer app or making the next Twitter, the next Facebook, um, and moving west in order to seek that opportunity. Other people, um, especially from the Northeast, move out west to seek a better climate, um, change of pace, other sort of job opportunities, etc. Um, and people are moving south because there is sort of a booming cities and ever-growing cities. Places like Asheville in the Carolinas, Austin, Texas, um, post-Katrina, people coming back and trying to revitalize New Orleans, um, as well as places like right here in Doral, right? Um, and a place like Florida specifically is very attractive to people because of a lack of sales tax um, that might be very, very, um, a lack of state tax, I mean. <laughs> state tax, I wish there wasn't any sales tax. A lack of state tax, um, and all we have to pay is federal taxes, so that is very, very attractive to other people versus, um, versus some other states. Now, usually migration refers to a sort of permanent move from one place to another place, um, but there is such a thing as kind of a non a permanent sort of nomadic state that people can enter into, which is called transhumans. And that is semi-nomadic migration. Um, usually if you move from one country to another country, you end up sort of living there um, and hanging out the rest of your days, maybe even in the same city, with maybe some small moves here and there. There are people that either, um, through a variety of circumstances, uh, self-imposed or not, um, will move from place to place and not stay in one place for very long, and that is called transhumans. Now, let's look at, um, instead of the types of migration, let's look at why it is that people migrate. And there are a few categories, uh, the first one being political circumstances, such as um, government uh, dictatorship issues in Haiti, uh, same thing in Cuba, which caused um, the Marielle boat lift. Other such political circumstances that caused people to move away from their home country. Also, economic conditions drive people um, from places and also pull people towards places. Um, one example is here in Africa, where we have a variety of countries exhibiting what are called islands of development. Small pockets where development is occurring, um, greater economic growth is happening, and therefore people from other parts of Africa are moving to um, other parts of the continent in order to sort of seek a better position. So this map looks at how many workers are going into a variety of places and how many things are leaving uh, those places of development and the, the movement of goods back and forth as well as the movement of people back and forth due to these sort of expanding positive economic conditions. Um, and then on the other hand, we also have a primary reason for a lot of uh, Mexican immigration within the U.S. Um, seeking better economic conditions for them. Uh, so here's a picture of the border between the U.S. and Mexico. Historically, we also see um, these kinds of economic-based migrations happening um, in the Southeast Asian region. So in the late 1800s and early 1900s, Chinese migrated throughout Southeast Asia to work in trade, commerce, and finance. So the largest concentrations of this late 1800s and early 1900s Chinese migration occurred in uh, Manila in the Philippines, parts of Malaysia, Java, Sumatra, Malaysia, uh, Singapore specifically, um, Ho Chi Minh City in Vietnam, Bangkok in Thailand, and um, Myanmar or Burma. Another reason why people will choose to migrate is due to armed conflict and civil war. And here are some examples of places that have exhibited such conflicts, such as Guatemalans, um, and specifically um, the sort of continued tensions between Guatemala and Belize, um, or the 
area known as Belize, depending on who you ask. Um, the Vietnamese migration caused by the Vietnam War and subsequent conflicts. Rwandans, um, the conflict between the Hutus and the Tutsis outlined in the popular movie Hotel Rwanda. Um, this would be an excellent moment if you have seen Hotel Rwanda, which I know some of you have um, in your world history classes. This would be a great time to, um, if you haven't seen it, find a person in the class who has and have them explain to you the, the sort of plot of Hotel Rwanda. There's a conflict between a group known as the Hutus and a group known as the Tutsis, um, and one of those groups sought refuge um, in this one hotel, and all sorts of interesting things ensued. But I'll have them tell it. Go ahead. I'll wait. Are we all caught up on the plot of Hotel Rwanda? Awesome. Moving on. Other things that can drive people away from a place or cause people to come to a place are environmental conditions. So natural hazards um, or disasters, etc., can actually move people um, or cause people to move elsewhere, such as the Irish potato famine in the um, mid-1800s that drove a huge, huge spike um, in Irish immigration to the U.S. Uh, between the years of, say, 1835 and 1860, we see a large spike of folks coming to the U.S. due to the Irish potato famine. Here we have a map uh, from 1872 outlining the Irish population because we see these connected lines. That makes it an isometric map, exactly. Well done, whoever that was. Whoever that was that said isometric, you're awesome. You got it right. And you can see that there is a huge concentration of Irish folks um, in New York and Boston. Other examples include um, the Great Depression, um, but mostly um, the sort of the, the Dust Bowl situation that happened um, in the Midwest where there was a huge, huge drought which caused a great amount of devastation for folks that were relying on those crops to make money. Um, and so that basically drove people away from that Dust Bowl area to other places in order to seek better opportunity. Um, and then we have things like uh, Hurricane Katrina, which is also um, a huge environmental condition that um, forced the evacuations of hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of people away from the city of New Orleans. Another example, uh, another reason that people leave um, is due to uh, cultural or religious forces. Uh, one example of a religious-based migration is the Mormon trek, outlined here in this map, which occurred from 1830 to 1851, and it started off in New York in 1830, um, paused in Kirkland, continued to Independence, um, and then kind of stopped in a variety of places until eventually settling in Utah in about 1847. Now what this refers to here, this area, refers to a proposed state of Desiree, and Desiree is a sort of uh, proposed state that M Mormon suggested um, and wanted to be recognized by the U.S. government as a separate state um, with a particular Mormon government. Um, that didn't exactly work out so well, but the sort of proposed establishment of the state explains why it is that this area continues to be um, mostly settled uh, by folks, adherents of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Other examples include uh, the partition of Pakistan and India, uh, which caused the migration of both Hindus and um, Pakistani Muslims, um, as well as uh, migration to Israel 
um, post the establishment of the Israeli state, which, let's check it out. So there is significant uh, Jewish migration to Israel post its establishment 1948, um, mostly coming from places like Central Europe, um, which was uh, communist from 1948 to 1990. It's the birthplace of over 80% of the European Jewish immigrants seeking a new home and a refuge in Israel between 1948 and 1970. So a lot of those folks making their way to Israel, as well as folks seeking refuge from the Arab world, um, places like Morocco, Algeria, Tunisia, Libya, and Egypt, uh, seeking refuge in Israel, as well as uh, Syria, Iraq, and Yemen. And then this is Israel. Uh, Israel as it was partitioned between 1948 and 1967. Now we talked about kinds of migration, we talked about causes of migration, and now let's look at a little bit more nuanced way of thinking about why it is that people move from one place to another place. Um, you can be pushed from a place by some factors, or you can be pulled into a place. They have some sort of awesome tractor beam um, that pulls you in and attracts you uh, into another place. So a push factor is just that. It is a negative home condition that pushes the decision to migrate. It pushes people out of a country. So examples of push factors include a loss of a job, a lack of opportunities, overcrowding, as in the case with Java, famine, in the case of Ireland and its potato famine, war, in the case of many places, um, or disease. A pull factor, on the other hand, is something that attracts people to the place, right? So you can sort of gather from all of the maps that have seen significant migration to the good old US of A that America has some significant pull factors that pull people into this place, such as job opportunities, a better climate, lower taxes, um, there's more room to grow, or it's considered safer. Or these sort of general all-purpose, I want a better life for me and my family, and this is a place where I know I can get it. Another thing to take into account is just how satisfied you are with your home territory. Um, so that is measured by a concept called place utility. The higher your place utility, uh, the higher the place utility, the higher your degree of satisfaction with a place, so the less likely it is that you're going to go there, um, or rather the, the less likely it is that you're going to leave your home territory if you have a high degree of satisfaction with it. Um, if there is a high degree of satisfaction with a place, a high place utility, it's also likely that that place exhibits a significant amount of pull factors that would allow people to come to that place. A lot of people are satisfied. There's probably a lot of good stuff going on there, right? So people are probably attracted to that place. The lower the place utility, the more likely it is that you're going to want to leave because you're not satisfied with the place. So all of these things, push and pull factors, as well as a place's utility, um, ultimately drives the decision to migrate. And the ultimate question is, is it better to stay or should I go? Should I stay or should I go now? If I stay, there will be trouble. If I leave, it will be double, right? Things to consider, things to consider when trying to figure out your, your decision to migrate there. Um, another kind of migrant is a little bit more on the temporary side, so we're still kind of constantly uh, zooming in and looking for more nuance in our, in our conversations about migrants. Um, all migrants are not created equal. Some of them are considered guest workers in a given country. Um, guest workers usually have things like short-term work visas that uh, basically allow them a temporary stay in a country for a very, very specific reason. Um, you might have a student visa, which basically allows you to live in a country um, specifically for the purpose of education. Uh, once you graduate or once you decide to leave 
um, that educational institution, then your uh, student visa is up and you have to return to your home country. Same thing with work. You're there for work and work alone and it's usually um, on the short term. And while they're there, in whatever given country, um, that worker will often send remittances to the home country. Now, what do you think remittances are? Using context clues, um, a remittance is basically money. Money, medicine, gifts, um, whatever you might send to your home country, and with the hopes that either um, eventually your family might join you, um, and then your work visa will become a permanent migration, or um, you'll just keep sending remittances to your home country in order to support the people that are there that may or may not actually leave and, and come hang out with you. Uh, European guest workers, um, this is kind of an old map because Yugoslavia is still a thing um, <laughs> on this map and it isn't a thing anymore. Um, but case in point, it shows you um, a kind of modern uh, post-Soviet Union, um, but definitely sort of before um, this last decade, um, sort of like a mid, maybe like a mid-90s, like early to mid-90s uh, guest worker situation where the purple, by the way, it's a choropleth map. If you guess that, pat yourself on the back, you get a gold star. Um, this choropleth map shows um, how many people are going into a place and how many people are coming out of a place. So in a sort of um, early to mid to even late 90s, um, you see a lot of movement to United Kingdom, Sweden, Denmark, Germany, the Netherlands, Belgium, Luxembourg, France, Switzerland, and Austria from its surrounding areas. And knowing what we know about push and pull factors, as well as um, other such factors, uh, we know that there are probably a huge amount of economic opportunities available in those cities that weren't available in other places. Now, migration doesn't just happen willy-nilly, right? Um, there are different ways that people can migrate. Um, the first one is called step migration. Um, some people don't make the sort of extreme uh, to move from one country completely to another country. Um, there are some steps in between. So there are smaller, less extreme moves on the way to a sort of complete um, and, and more permanent stay in a place. For example, I live in a farm, and maybe I want a better life, but maybe I'm not really prepared to make the move to, you know, New York just yet. Um, so instead, I decide to um, go from a farm where I might be, you know, alone, say for a couple of people, um, I might move to, to a village and, and hang out in a village for a while. Um, then I'll move to a small town. Then. Once I'm comfortable and I can sort of deal with a small town, then maybe I'll make the move and go to New York City. Maybe I'll go to a major city afterwards. But instead of going straight from farm to New York City, which can be a huge, huge culture shock, among other things, um, there are smaller, less extreme moves that can be taken, and that is called step migration. Then there's chain migration, um, where you establish a, a link or chain for future migrants. Um, it's, it's what's called a migration field. So um, this is basically a situation where perhaps somebody like a guest worker or another migrant provides information, money, a place to stay, or a job for other family and friends. So instead of one family making the entire trip, one person will go first, establish um, either an enclave or, or a site for them, send back some money, um, and then those folks can eventually move, um, move along with them, right? And then you can actually sort of maybe see, see a pattern emerging, right? So instead of everybody moving all at once, um, one person might go send money back, and then the people will join them later. And so it's, it's a connection, it's a chain uh, for future migrants. Then there's channel migration, where you have clear pathways and travel routes established.
So a place like the Trail of Tears is actually very, very clearly marked. Like you can actually travel that trail. There is a clear pathway um, from one place to another. Uh, the Oregon Trail is another example. Um, I highly recommend, if you have any time, to seek out a way to play um, the game, The Oregon Trail, um, so that you can sort of get a sense of what it was like to migrate during the 1800s and make your way out west and manifest your destiny and hopefully, um, hopefully seek your fortune. Um, so in, in the game Oregon Trail, which is kind of a throwback, um, you have a covered wagon, you get to pick what kind of a job you have, and that determines the amount of resources you take with you, and then you are met with a series of challenges along the way, and hopefully, if you manage everything correctly, you make it to Oregon and seek out a new life. Other examples are sister cities that you can find along the borders of U.S. and Mexico, uh, the border between U.S. and Mexico, um, where you have these sort of cities that are directly across the border, and, and you can see a sort of channel in between them. So there's Laredo and Nuevo Laredo, um, Brownsville and Matamoros, McAllen and Reynosa, Eagle Pass, Piedras Negras, El Paso and Juarez, uh, Columbus and Palomas, Nogales and Nogales, um, Yuma and San Luis, and Calexico and Mexicali, San Diego and Tijuana, there is a clear pathway between those two cities. There's a reason that they call them sister cities. Um, there's a, usually a sort of clear travel route uh, between those two cities that aid in um, this country to country migration. For example, um, you have this chain um, from Mexico to Arizona. This particular route is well worn from Ahuacatlan to Querétaro, right, all the way up to Sonoita, to Arizona, um, either to uh, Piauic, Phoenix, Tucson, Nogales, Santa Ana, right, and so you see this um, very established chain, and this is only one group of undocumented migrants from a small village north of Mexico City to Phoenix, Arizona, and this is the route that they took. Now, there are certain laws of migration established by this guy, Ravenstein, and he has certain laws of migration <clears throat> that kind of determine um, who gets to go, what reasons, um, and it's sort of, you know, kind of a, a sort of macro model of migration. The first, most migrants only go a short distance. Uh, most migrants only go a short distance. Um, they only go about as far as maybe the next country over, um, the, the, the nearest place where they can find the best opportunity. If migration takes place over longer distances, then you're more likely to be going to a big city. Uh, nobody is traveling across the Atlantic Sea, um, across the Atlantic Ocean, in order to go to a tiny town of 50, necessarily, right? Usually, if you're going to be traveling a really long distance, then it's because you're going to a major, major city. And usually, migration proceeds step by step. So it's not one big leap. There are usually steps to be taken on the way to full migration. Most migration is rural to urban, mostly um, because of things like economic conditions and job opportunities being a major uh, push and pull factor for people. Each flow produces a counterflow. So for every sort of group that leaves, um, there might be a flow of people coming in in order to replace them, um, or for every uh, sort of people that come into 
a place. There might be a counterflow out of a certain place, um, maybe sometimes directly in response to the sort of inward migration. Most migrants are adults, and most international migrants are young males. Now, this is an older model um, that I think was, was established in the mid-20th century, uh, but nowadays, women and girls actually represent 40 to 60 percent of all international migrants. And, usually because of economic pushes and pulls. So for the most part, these women and girls, this 40 to 60 percent, are seeking better opportunities, better lives for them and their families. So when you are leaving specifically because of forced migration, um, you are usually termed a, a refugee. Um, so what is the definition of the term, the actual definition of the term refugee? Um, the official definition was established in the year 19, uh, 1951 um, in the uh, United Nations Convention relating to the status of refugees. The official definition is um, a refugee is a person with a well-founded fear of being persecuted for reasons of race, religion, or nationality. So, in the case of Rwanda, um, the, the differences between the Hutus and the Tutsis, um, even though technically um, they were of the same sort of um, phenotypic uh, racial background, um, or maybe even the same ethnic background, uh, there were still visual differences between the two groups that enabled uh, one group um, to sort of persecute the other. Same thing in Darfur. And this is a map of uh, the sort of travel of refugees. Um, so there are internal refugees um, and international refugees. Um, in Colombia, for example, there are over a million internal refugees, as well as Angola, uh, the Democratic Republic of Congo, Burundi, Uganda, Sudan, which is where Darfur is located. Myanmar and Burma, as well as Turkey, um, site of um, the region known as uh, Kurdistan, or part of the region known as Kurdistan, which makes sense. Um, and international refugees are in great numbers uh, from the Middle East. Um, the sort of pocket of holy lands is very, very highly contested, um, very conflicted, as well as places like Bosnia and Herzegovina. Um, Guatemala and El Salvador as well, and then um, Haiti. In Darfur in particular, um, there, is, um, there is a situation of, of genocide specifically in Darfur. So Darfur is located in Sudan in eastern, northeastern Africa, right underneath Egypt. And then this is the particular region that is heavily contested in Darfur. The conflict in Darfur is called a genocide just because of the mass amounts of people um, that have either uh, died as a result of this conflict or have been displaced due to this conflict. And displaced would be um, referring to forced migration. So at least 350,000 people have died due to this conflict, and 1.8 million people have been displaced, have been forcefully migrated, um, have forcefully migrated due to this conflict, which is basically a conflict between um, Arab groups and uh, African groups, so rebel fighters that are of the African side and um, Arab fighters, um, for example, this, this Janjaweed militia group. As a result of the conflict in Darfur, um, you see an international migration to the surrounding areas, 
Um, so those 1.8 displaced people usually will end up in Eritrea, Ethiopia, Kenya, Uganda, Congo, uh, the Central African Republic, Chad, Libya, and Egypt. Great. So hope you have not so much enjoyed, right, because um, there are highs and lows to migration. There are pushes and pulls to migration and its causes. Um, when we meet again, we are going to talk about population. So we can't really uh, know a lot about migration until we know how many people there are, how many people exist, how many are born, how many are dying, and what that all means for the state of our world. Uh, thanks very much for hanging out. Um, hope that you have gotten enough knowledge. I'm definitely going to post this up online for you on the course website in order for you to peruse at a later date. So I will see you when I see you. Be nice to the sub, all right?